Amen. Y'all all all know me. Amen. One of your own. Amen. I'm not trying to put on airs or do anything like that. I'm just here to deliver the word of God as I was assigned. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read St. Luke. We're going to read verses 5 through 7. If you haven't, say amen. amen. It is the custom of this house that we stand during the reading of the word of God. Because as the Bible declares, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So as we read the word of God, it's just like God walked into the room. In the same way you would honor the president of the United States or the judge in your local courthouse. You would stand, wouldn't you? Amen. So, St. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It reads on this wise. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Agia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Somebody say Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Verse 7 says, and they had no child. Say that with me. And they had no child. Because that Elizabeth was barren. Say that with me. Elizabeth was barren. Uh -huh. And they both were well now well stricken in years. You may take your seat. And as you take your seat, I want you to go back with me to the verse where it says, uh, verse 7. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. Say that with me. Elizabeth was barren. Now having said that, I need you, I need to hear you say this out of your mouth. I need you to declare this topic with me considering what we just read. I need you to say to yourself, I'm not what they called me. I'm not, I'm not what they called me. I'm going to let that sit with you for a minute. Say it again. I'm not what they called me. Now, the first thing I have to do, I have to go back to verse one, uh -huh. because if I go back to verse, if I don't go back to verse one, you won't understand the, the complete uh, text. If if I just go and start preaching, you got to understand the type of man this writer was. Oftentimes, Pastor Paul, we preach and when we preach. Sometimes we preach without the full understanding because sometimes we got to understand who's writing. Amen. In order to get this good revelation, because this is a good revelation today, but in order to get this good revelation, you got to understand this writer. Yeah. This writer's name is Luke. Uh -huh. And if you know anything about the 12 disciples or apostles, whatever you call them, you know that Luke was a physician. Yes, he was. And so what physicians pride themselves on is research. Physicians, because of the nature of their job, they messing with your body. Uh -huh. So you just can't haphazardly go in there and do surgery and diagnosing people. You can't do that haphazardly. You got to know your stuff. Amen. And so if you're going to be a physician, a good one, you have to do your research. And so even though Luke is saved now, and that doesn't change his nature. His nature as a writer is to gather information and research so that he can properly diagnose people. Is that right? Amen. And so he needed to properly even diagnose, in his opinion, the word of God. Luke was the most detailed writer. He was the most detailed writer. He was very detail-oriented. He had to be. Luke gave the most descriptions of healings. If you read the book of Luke, you'll find the most healings documented because that's what he was interested in. You'll find him talking really about, John, only one really talking about John the Baptist's birth. So I'm going to read to you in this scripture what Luke was actually doing. You with me? Amen. It's verse 1 says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, so these were things that were believed among the people, amen? Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So where he got his information from was people who were there long before he came. Eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. 
it seemed good to me also, hear him talking like a doctor, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of these things. Do you hear him as a writer? He wanted you to be certain of what really was happening here. Wherein thou has been instructed. So the first thing he has to do is give you what's really going on. Here, he's giving you information from the vital statistics of the, er the area of Judea, where Zacharias and Elizabeth lived. So he's reading from the records. He's recording, as you first heard, from eyewitnesses. Somebody say eyewitnesses. eyewitnesses. People who literally saw what was going on. People who were there. Because what happens with us in this day and time, we have the to proclivity to start talking about stuff we don't really know. We don't know nothing. We don't have to know anything about a person. We'll start telling all their business just like we was there. Just like we saw it. Just like we knew them. But Luke was not such a writer. Luke investigated before he wrote anything. He wanted you to know what I'm writing. You can bank on it. You can take this to the bank. And so here we are. He starts out telling you where Elizabeth and Zacharias were uh, from. It's amen. amen. And he starts telling you Elizabeth were barren and now they old. Amen. Is that right? Amen. And so I will admit to you, I preached this message before. But I thank God when I looked and I saw my sister here come through the door, I understood why God led me to preach it again. Because her and I had an in-depth conversation the last Sunday that she was here. I didn't come today to talk about John the Baptist. Come on, man. We all know how it, how it went yeah. down, how when uh, Elizabeth greeted Mary, according to scripture, the baby leaped in her womb. Right. I'm not here to talk about that. Right. We beat that to death. We all know that. I'm not here to talk about John the Baptist being beheaded. I'm not here to talk about him being a forerunner. I'm not here to talk about none of that. Uh, Elder Wright, I'm not here, not here to reinvent the wheel on that. What I'm here to dig deep into today is Elizabeth. Uh -huh. Because she carried John the Baptist in her womb. Mm -hmm. And she was called barren, but right now she's six months pregnant. Isn't that something? Isn't it? Ask your neighbor, isn't that something? That they called her barren Now she's sitting here six months pregnant See how people can say things about you And then you go and prove them wrong Then they sit there looking stuck Because they said this and that about you Not having the full information Not having done their research Just start spreading stuff That they heard about you And then they looking crazy When they see you doing better Than they expected you to do Matter of fact, stop there prophesying to somebody and tell them, I'm doing better than they expected me to. Yeah, I came to talk about Elizabeth today. And I'm rewinding to talk about what they called her. Because they called her something that was offensive in that day. Do you not know, if you do your research on women of those times, their children were their worth. Being able to be fruitful was their, their, their worth. They, didn't, they weren't considered a real woman if they couldn't get pregnant. If they couldn't be fruit, we can, we can go all the way back to Genesis with this. He gave us that decree. Be fruitful and what? Multiply. So she couldn't even, according to them, live up to that ordinance to be fruitful. And now here she is old. And so can you imagine thinking that it's over for her? Can I park right here and prophesy to somebody that it's never too late for you? Amen. Oh, God, it's, I'm, I'm preaching already. Amen. Tell them, tell the person on the side, it's still not too late for you. It's still not too late for you. Even though you haven't even really begun to do what you Amen. thought you'd originally do, it don't mean you should stay stuck there and not do nothing. Right. Everything you were given, you still have the ability to do it. Yes. Nobody's stopping you but you. Do you not know it's a fact we are our own worst enemies? Amen. Do you not know it's a fact God has empowered us and given us each our own unique gifting? We all have a calling. We all have a specific thing that he gave us to do. And just because you're not doing it now does not mean you won't do it. Amen. Amen. I'm preaching 
already, son. Just because you're not doing it now does not mean you won't do it. That's right. If you look at every successful man and woman in, in our country, you will find that you look at people like Starbucks. I'm just going to do Starbucks. If you would look at Starbucks and see how amazing Starbucks is now, and I'm using Starbucks because that's my favorite place in the whole wide world other than the church. Amen. Uh, my cousin Lon didn't know I love me some Starbucks. We we went to New York. We took a road trip to New York, and I had to, we stopped at the fanciest uh, Starbucks I think I ever seen. That thing was whoo, wasn't it, Lon? Indeed it was. So Starbucks is, is I'm not here to preach Starbucks, but I'm here to let you know that do you not know this man was turned down over 255 times from the bank? Yeah. Wow. Wow. He didn't start Starbucks till he was well in his 50s. Wow. And he had that vision and he sat on it and did nothing with it. Can you imagine how many people he probably been telling his vision to yeah. and now he, he is older and they think he ain't gonna do nothing? And, and 200, I think it was 255 times. Don't quote me. I'm just, I'm just thinking. But go back and look at it. it, it after all those times, let's just say, I'm going to guesstimate, 255 times. Can you imagine after 255 times you keep going to a bank? And then it'll turn you down 255 times. We get stuck after one or two times. We get depressed after one or two times. Somebody telling us no. I'm preaching to somebody. Amen. This man did up. This man went over 255 times back to a bank. Finally, somebody gave him a yes. And thus we have Starbucks. And so I said that to say this. I'm going to challenge you that have been called out of your name to give folk back that name they gave you. Let them know I'm not what you called me. You can't put your words on me just because that's what you feel about me. Mm -hmm. Give them back those words they put out against you because that's not who you are. Somebody shout, I'm not what they call me. There is a specific reason why you cannot, cannot take on what people have called you. And I, and I say this everywhere I go, so if I've already said it here, just forgive me. I'm gonna say it for maybe somebody didn't hear it. There is a reason why you got to be careful what goes into your ear gate. You got to be careful who's speaking into you and over you. Uh-huh. Because, I'll go back. According to the Levitical laws, when a slave was a slave for six years or more, and he, he, he could be free. But if that particular slave wanted to remain a slave, all he had to do was go to his master and let him know, I want, I'm happy being your slave. I want to stay under your leadership. So what he would do, he would go to the outside of his master's house. It was a whole ceremony. And he would put his ear to his master's doorpost. And his master would take a nine inch awl and bang it through his earlobe and pierce his ear. And then he would pull it out and he would walk around for the rest of his life wearing that earring in his ear. Oh are, you, are you with me? And everywhere he went or she went, people would know he is a slave, but he's a willing slave. Stay with me. He's a slave, but he's a willing slave. Some of y'all took on the characteristics of what they called you. And you walk in it, and you're willingly taking it on. But what you're taking on is something that's really not yours. I'm preaching to somebody today. And he would walk around with his master's earring in his ear. I said that to say this. The reason you got to be careful who speaks into your hearing is because whoever got your ear owns you. Y'all going to catch it in the car on the way home. Whoever has your ear, somebody say owns you. They can tell you anything you that they want to tell you, you'll believe it. They'll sit there and tell you lies to your face and you'll believe it. Beat you 
you all upside your head, kick you, stomp you, and then tell you I love you and you'll believe it. Walk around with you, go out clubbing with you, party with you, then sleep with your man and still tell you I love you. Whoa! Why? Because they got your ear. They got your ear. You let them speak one too many times in your spirit and so now they own you. And they can come to you and tell you anything. You go off somewhere and fight for them. And they dead wrong. Am I talking to that perfect people today? You go off because of them. Because they got your ear. And therefore, somebody say they own you. And so, you got to be careful because, say this with me, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words. The stuff people say to you, Aunt Barbara, are not just words. No, uh uh. Their power and their life or their death. Death and life is in there. So they're speaking to you for one or more reasons either to speak life into you or death into you. Say with me, this is why you can't tell everybody what you're about to do. This is why you can't tell everybody your dreams. This is why you can't share stuff with everybody. Because the people, some of the people you think got your back do not have your back. Some of the people you think love you really hate you. Some of the people you think are with you really are working against you. Because they got your ear. They know they can say anything. They'll tell you something and then go get on the phone. They'll, matter of fact, they so slick now. They'll be sitting beside you and be texting somebody about you while you're sitting beside them. I've seen them do it. Amen, somebody. So you got to be careful what you let people speak into you. Somebody say this with me. I need you to really get this. I'm not here to bore you today, but we done shout it. It's time for the word. If they told you you wasn't no good, they wasn't telling you that to cuss you out, baby. They were cursing your life. Yeah. Yeah. And you took it as just they cussed me out. And so you might even laugh about it. Oh, he called me this. He called me a dirty dog. Oh, no, they have dirty dog. No, baby. He was prophesying to you yeah. that you are a dirty dog. And you didn't get it. You should have sent that thing back to the sender. But instead, you took it as a joke. You took it as just a cussing out. But it really was not him cussing out. It really wasn't her cussing you out. She was speaking that dirty dog lifestyle over you. Amen. And then you found out later you started becoming a little damn dirty dog and you couldn't figure out how you could get out of it. Because you accepted that word. There was an assignment attached to that word. I had an uncle that told me when I was about eight or nine years old, you ain't gonna never be nothing. When I was young, he told me, you ain't gonna never be nothing. And for the longest time, I could not get myself together. And them words kept coming back to me. Is that, anybody ever spoke anything crazy over your life? And you sat there, and it bothered you so bad, and then you found yourself acting in what they said? Words are powerful. Words are powerful. But here is the thing. The people in Elizabeth's region was talking about it. Now, it's one thing for some random stranger to come and tell me I ain't nothing. But it's come something else different if somebody in my house called me that. One of my close friends calls me that. It's a totally different thing. I don't care no random stranger said, but let somebody in your family call you. Let your mother call you something. Let your daddy call you something. That them words stab you in your heart. So you've got to be really careful the words that are spoken over you because they could literally destroy your entire life. Watch this. Slaves were actually renamed by their masters. You gotta stay with me. They couldn't even keep their birth name. They had to submit to the degree sign where they weren't even called any longer by the name they were given at birth. They started acting on what he called them. They had to 
take on his name. Why? Because that's what he said. There was an assignment attached to those names that these people were. Are you getting this today? Anybody getting this? If you've been called in this thing enough times, it start getting in your gut. You start believing that's what you are. Guess what? It's not just an assignment. It's an assignment and it's also a title. That becomes your title. Mm -hmm. Womanizer. Come on with Ho. Come on now. Gold digger. Drunk. Crackhead. Tell me them ain't titles. That ain't just no name. That's a title. They're telling you that's who you are. And you gotta remain stuck to that. The woman with the issue of blood, how come nobody never called her by her name? That wasn't her name. But every time you open that Bible, what do you see? The woman with the issue of blood. Somebody even had the common decency to give her a name. The demoniac of Gadara. He got delivered from the spirits. But they, when you read it, you still say, what? The demoniac. The ten lepers. What were their names? They got healed. But they're still called what? When you read it. It's a terrible thing to be called by your fault. It's a terrible thing to be called by your issue. It's a terrible thing, son, to be named by your proclivity. So after a while, folk don't even know your name. He that drug dealer. He the dope dealer. Do he have a name? She that hoe from Ralph Dunbar. Do she have a name? So nobody knows your name. They just know your face and what you do. Stay with me. The crackhead from Westside. They don't even know your name. They just know you a crackhead from Westside. And they start telling stuff that you did and stuff that folk told them you did. So you're known by your issue or your struggle, but they don't know your name. So long after you get delivered and saved and they see you again because they don't follow up and try to figure out stuff, they see you. You ain't been on crack in 20 years, but you still a crackhead from Westside. You still a hoe from Dunbar. You still a dope dealer from Smyrna. Am I talking right in this place? It's a terrible thing to only be known by your issue. And they don't even know your name. My God. Yes. Tell somebody, but God is about to prove that God is wrong. Call me what you want. You can't stop my victory. Call me what you want. You can't nullify or deduce my deliverance. Call me what you want. You can't put God out of my life. Call me what you want. You can't take away my salvation. Call me what you want. I ain't got an answer to it. Somebody shout, call me what you want. Because I ain't there no more. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise. I felt it right there. Y'all remember the, the man that they left on the side of the road that the good Samaritan had to go and see about? The man laid in the ditch that day. All the Christians are supposed to be religious leaders walked all past the man, didn't know his name, saw him laying in the gutter where the robbers and the thieves had beat him up and robbed him of his money. But one person only didn't even say he was a believer. One person came and pulled him up, took him home, and nursed him back to health. And I can imagine those same thieves going back and they couldn't find him where they left him. Somebody shout, I'm not where they left him. Ooh, am I preaching good? Am I preaching? Am I preaching good? I'm not where they left me on part of They still got my testimony, but they can have it because I ain't where they left me. They still know stuff I did, but they can have that too because I'm not where they left me. They got dirt on me that I did years ago, but they can have that dirt too because I'm not where they left me. I don't care if you know what you know about me. I don't even care if you caught me doing it. I'm not there where you left me. Yes, I did it. Guilty as charged. You want something really to talk about? I did it and I loved it. But I'm not there no more. I wasn't living no miserable life of sin. When I smoked weed, I loved it. When I drank bull, I loved it. When I laid with random strangers, I loved it.